It's something we need because, again, it's putting food on the table, and yeah. we're not only serving our local community, we're serving the nation, we're serving yeah. internationally. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. Faviola Barbosa believes in education and leads an organization that allows the farming community to help fund its own to go to college. Her story itself is incredible as well. Coming to the U.S. from Mexico as a very young child and working her way through college and, and in the field of education and now back to the farming community with education as her focus. It's a part of the food system that isn't directly on the beaten path when you think about growing food, but it is an, uh, an important part of that community uh, and the investment that it makes in its own people and its future. I'm Dylan Honkoop. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. Enjoy this conversation uh, in Wenatchee with Faviola Barbosa of the Washington Apple Education Foundation. So explain first, like, what is the Washington Apple Education Foundation? Like, a apples and education, how do those fit together? What do you, what do you folks do? So this organization, or this foundation, I should say, was founded in 1994. And it is known to be the charity of the tree fruit industry, specifically cherries, pears, and apples. And its mission is to impact lives through access to educational opportunities. And um, so now it has evolved into providing yeah. scholarships to over 300 students wow. throughout the year. And it's now become, it, we award over a million dollars a year in scholarships. So why? Like what kind of students is, I mean, it's really the, the tree fruit community, the farmers and, and the businesses surrounding it, yes. supporting students. Correct. What and kind of students? Like f kids who are going to become farmers or? Well, not particularly farmers. So we have two tracks. We have, mm -hmm. we award scholarships for individuals that either they themselves come from the tree fruit industry or their parents come from the tree fruit industry mm -hmm. and they want to become doctors or lawyers or so forth. Okay, yeah. And then we have the other track where students that want to go into the industry and not necessarily um, farming, but it can be, um, they can do, it can be a technical degree, a business degree, management degree. And so part of that is educating individuals, letting them know that there are many opportunities within the ag community and uh, we will fund their education if they're interested in going into those specific uh, careers. Yeah, and that's a good point too to, to to point out what you know working for a farm might mean in this day and age. Yeah, it may mean working in the field, getting your hands dirty, driving tractor, pruning trees, whatever it might be. That's the perception of a farmer. <laughs> But like you said, those other roles are needed too. Yes. The scientist in the lab who's checking everything and making sure it's on point. You know, the, the person in the office running the business operations to make sure that, you know, one, that you don't go bankrupt, <laughs> and two, that all the rules are be fall uh, being followed and all that stuff. So it takes all those. I, I, I've had that too when I talk with FFA uh, students, and that's always, they're always reminding them of that too, like, Getting into the world of farming and producing food doesn't just have to mean putting your boots on and going out into the field. Correct. How then would you explain this fitting together? Like how are you supporting the food system? The food system in a way is, is supporting students through your program. How would you say in turn you support the food that we produce here and everybody eats? Because again, we represent apples, pears, and cherries, and that's a huge industry. Yeah. Not only in, I mean, we're Wenatchee, we're known for being the apple capital of the world. Right. And um, a lot of our fruit is exported to other countries as well. But being that we have a variety of apples, pears, and cherries, um, there's many options now to be a part of that food community. So it just kind of grows you know, rising tide, like lifts all boats, right? As, as that is supported, it brings more students and, and benefits families and what goes around comes around, right? Correct. 
Yes. Like, yeah. Share some stories or something. Like, give some specific examples. I, I would love to hear, you know, what, what kinds of students, what, what they're doing and, and, and how you guys are able to help them. So I've been with the agency only six months, mm -hmm. and I've met, uh, well, we just had our luncheons. We had one in Wenatchee, and we had one in Yakima, and I was able to meet over 100 students at each one of the luncheons, and each one of them has a story. Hmm. How, um, you know, they, whether they come from the industry, watching their parents work hard, um, knowing that it's uh, labor-intense employment, how they want to be able to make a difference in the world as well. Mm. And you know, you hear stories of either, um, I wanna go into the medical field, become a nurse, um, or I wanna become a teacher because I know that's so important nowadays. Um, and again, we have the students that wanna go into the industry, that wanna become, um, go into the technology because technology now is huge in the agriculture mm. and um, so it's just, it's beautiful to hear all their stories and also how the impact that our scholarships will provide for these students because what's really cool about our program is that we don't provide a scholarship just once, once a year. Mm. Uh, the students, once they become a f part of our family, we then follow them for the duration of their four years. Oh, wow. So we make sure that they are... Um, earning the grade point average that they need to. Some right. scholarships have particular uh, details that they have to uh, meet. Some accountability. Correct. Yeah. And making sure that if they're identifying uh, their pathway, that they're taking the courses that are in line with their pathway. They're not taking underwater basket weaving or something right. like that. Right. So we're making sure that they are on track to graduation. And not only that, but we want to make sure our graduation rate um, you know, out of our students, 84% of our students graduate with a degree within four years or less. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that they're meeting those requirements, um, they receive mentoring through our program, they're in touch with us continuously. And so we are able to then provide them a scholarship for all four years of their um, academic career. Say, I love this. this. These are things that a lot of people don't see. And the farming community generally doesn't do it for the purpose of getting accolades they do it because it's the right thing and they realize it's long term building and supporting their community mm -hmm. but when i talk with people outside of the farming world they just see farming and oh you're producing food and hopefully you make money at it you know some people think farmers get rich sometimes oftentimes they don't <laughs> but you know so i like to to expose that reality but also whether they're you know making it good or not there's so much investment in, in community mm -hmm. and that's why i refer to this more and more as i do more of these conversations and do more work as the farming community mm -hmm. more than just an industry because it is because there's this kind of stuff going on but again a lot of people don't see that and i love right. to shine a light on no farmers are investing in the next generation they are yes and that is so important because again these students a lot of them want to come back to their own community and mm -hmm. be able to be employed in their community whether it's with the industry within the industry or like i said just in their community and our, our program serves all the way pretty much from the canadian border to nascot all the way all central washington mm -hmm. down to pasco um, tri-cities all that area so wow. we cover a lot of ground over our scholarship announcement time we traveled over 1300 miles in five days to make these announcements to the students and it's pretty phenomenal and i know that wafe within high schools the counselors it's very well known and they promote it because they know that again they're not only going to get a scholarship for one year it's going to be for the duration of their four years but they're also going to get those wraparound services to support them and make sure that they are successful wow there's a lot to it. And again, not a lot of people see this. What, what did the farmers say about this and the people in those businesses that are supporting all of this? They obviously want to hear what the students need. Um, for example, we had one of our donors over the summer that we met and we were looking at how we could continue to support his recipients. Hmm. And um, we were brainstorming uh, how can you continue to uh, help the student because you know with fun financial aid you can only qualify for X amount and if you increase the scholarship amount that uh, then you don't become as eligible for 
the free the other free money right and so it's kind of hard to balance that that equation mm -hmm. um so we decided what about giving the students um laptops and so mm -hmm. we had new laptops delivered to these students and it was like we felt it was Christmas in August again because yeah. we got to give this out, and they, they were so grateful and so happy to receive these. But these are support services that students need, and so it's really cool to be able to work with the different donors and be able to brainstorm how they can continue to offer their assistance to students without um, penalizing them with their financial aid. What do you see being the long-term impact on the tree fruit community and the farming community and the food system as a whole from the work that you're doing with this? Obviously, we're creating um, individuals that are going to be contributing to the community and also to the industry. So again, mm -hmm. there's gonna be that um, sustainability and um, just educating others about our services yeah, as well is important. Exactly. How did you get into this role? What's your background that you came to, to be involved at this level? So my background is I have worked 18 years in higher education for three different community colleges, and I worked both on the student services side of the house and the instructional side of the house. Mm. And um, I actually come from farm working as well. My mm. parents were both farm workers. We migrated to this country when I was two wow. from Mexico, and they both worked in the industry for many, many years for two um, companies out in Orondo and um, they were able to save up and they purchased their own orchard as well. And so as a family, we had apples that we raised and um, produced. And uh, so I understand the labor and yeah. the, all the behind the scenes for uh, orchardists. Um, but now I'm learning about the other industry, the other side of the house right. of the industry. So it's pretty exciting. That's that's crazy. So this community is your community. Yes. You aren't just an executive that was brought in from somewhere else, not to knock on people who do that, because that's great too. But you, this is your, your whole life has been here with this community. Yes. Yes. I graduated from the local high school, had worked for the community college here locally, and then spread my wings and went to other community colleges. Yeah. But it's, for me, it's always been, um, you know, promoting higher education, yeah. Um, because I know that it makes a difference for, for a person. Yeah, what was that like growing up as a farm worker? I mean, that's, that's hard work. It can be a tough life, It, right? it is, it is. Um, I only worked doing, you know, sorting cherries, thinning, um, and picking cherries, but I never mm -hmm. did any of the really intense work. Uh, when my parents ran their orchard, I was a person that drove the tractor and moved the, the um, individuals from one row to another. Yeah. Um, but that was, it, yes, it was fun. And, um, and I have a high respect for individuals that have their own companies and their own orchards because it is pretty intense, yeah. Yeah, so your parents emigrated here when you were two years old and then eventually started their own orchard? Correct. How were they able to do that? I mean, that, that's got to really, you know, starting an orchard from scratch, it's got to be really tough. There were programs, um, I don't know if they still exist, but there mm. were programs where you could um, enter like a lottery with the government, with okay. the federal government, and apply for loans. Mm. And it was specifically for the egg industry. And I remember yeah. my parents applied for it. And um, like I said, it was a lottery. They were um, selected and because they had good credit and they had funds that they could put down as a down payment they were able to receive a loan directly from the Department of Ag Agriculture and be able to purchase their own orchard. Wow. So are they still doing that? Are they still with us? Or what what's, what's, was the story of that orchard? So we um, operated as much as we could. Um, it's probably been about 12 years that we um, decided to uh, pull out our, all our trees because there was that time when the apple industry kind of went down and mm -hmm. it was just really hard we have a small orchard it was only 10 acres yep. um and so just the cost were too high for us mm -hmm. we were not being we were not breaking even and so we felt that it was time to uh take out the trees we still own the property yep. uh but we now we now rent it out to individuals that want to grow vegetables oh, awesome. and then grow and sell their uh, produce at the farmer's market. Very, very cool. And so are, what are your parents up to then? 
they now just manage that. They're both retired. Yeah. Well, I should say my mom's definitely retired. <laughs> my dad claims to be retired, but he likes to go back and do cherries. <laughs> just like just about any farmer out there, it's, <laughs> once you do it, it's so in your blood, right? Yes, like it's yes. just hard. And especially somebody who's worked, I'm sure, as hard as he has. And I think about my dad, too. My dad just had to kind of shut down his farm within the past year. He was a red raspberry grower. <laughs> Um, so living that same thing and now he's not exactly sure what to do with himself yet because he he can't sit still and he yeah he wants to be out there doing stuff but he doesn't have his own thing to do do you, you probably don't remember coming to the US you're probably too young or do you do you have any memories back that far I just remember being around my cousins and yeah. they spoke English and I didn't <laughs> understand what they were saying but it's just vague memories mm -hmm. so when yeah, you, but you, you thankfully were young when you got to start learning English as the younger you are. Yes. That's why I still regret that I didn't work harder at Spanish when I was younger <laughs> because my Spanish is still terrible <laughs> and my older brain now doesn't learn it as quickly. But yeah, that's, that's a wild story that's been lived by so many people. But I think a lot of people, because it's like, oh yeah, I came to the U.S. from Mexico, worked on a farm. People feel like, oh yeah, it's just the same thing. Each one of those stories is unique mm -hmm. and intense. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes families like yours work hard. They aren't into, you know, whining about all the details. But when you sit down with folks, I'm sure like your parents and really hear about, no, we had to do this. Mm -hmm. And it, we didn't have any, you know, how hard they had to work and how little they had to grow from nothing. Yeah. It's, it always amazes me yeah. when I hear those details and, and just what families go through. Yeah. What, why, do you know why they left Mexico? Um, well, apparently we came up here just for the season as a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my mom was actually pregnant with my brother. Oh, wow. And um, because she was picking pears, uh, she actually went into labor prior to his wow. due date. And with my brother being born here, my parents felt, that we needed to stay so we could take care of that that debt yeah for and sure. because of my brother we stayed here but otherwise we would have gone back wow mm -hmm. that's an incredible story back to the conversation with faviola in just a moment but uh, speaking of education that's one of the things that the dairy farmers of washington are all about as well and they sponsor this podcast um, dairy farmers of washington their website is wadairy.org um, they're all about helping educate young people as well as adults, any of us, about what's really going on with milk and all the wonderful dairy products produced here in Washington State. So again, you can visit that website, wadairy.org, to find out more about what Washington dairy farmers are up to, uh, the nutritional benefits, the incredible recipes, and the sustainability that goes into producing milk and dairy here in Washington. Also, Mana Insurance Group, uh, a locally based um, insurance provider here in, in Washington State. Uh, it started in the community where I live, started by a guy that was in my class in high school. Known him since he was quite young. Great guy, great team that he's assembled. Many other people on that team that I know as well. And now they're operating in Washington. They have offices in California and Arizona. Um, they're doing a great job to get people connected with products that can help them protect their financial future. And do that all within the realm of having a plan um, to, to be prepared um, hopefully the worst never happens, but when it does, you want to have a plan. So Mana Insurance Group, they'll help you do that. They'll walk you through the process and they'll get you great deals. Manainsurancegroup.com. Now back to our conversation in Wenatchee with the Executive Director of the Washington Apple Education Foundation, Faviola Barbosa. What's it like now to come back? Because you were, you were in education and not necessarily connected directly to farming at all for some time, right? Mm -hmm. What's it like? Those are your two worlds now, professionally, education, your family, and your heritage is in agriculture. Yeah. What's that like to bring those two together? It's pretty exciting. I will say that when I talked to my dad and told him about this job, he actually got really emotional. And really? he was really, really excited for me. My dad's always been my cheerleader. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated from WSU and came back into the community and worked for Wenatchee Valley College, one of my 
roles was uh, working with recruitment and working um, with a academic advising. And so my dad literally walked around with my stack of business cards and he worked for one of the local companies here and he would walk around and ask people, do you, does, do you have someone that wants to go to college? Here, you should call my daughter. Yeah. And so he was always promoting college with everyone. And um, he would come and ta help me talk to uh, parents because you know, being a Latina, the first daughter, if you're going away for college, parents are like, mm, not gonna happen. Yeah. And my dad would come and talk to them because when I was at WSU, my parents lived, through col lived college through me. Hmm. They went to every single home football game. Yeah. They uh, would go to uh, you know, dad's weekend, mom weekend, all of the events up there because they were so excited to be a part of that and experience that. And so with that, when they would speak to other parents, they would talk about that experience that they um, had at WCU and how important it was for them to be a part of that experience as opposed to thinking they're moving away, right. they're gonna have a different life, I'm never gonna see them. It was up to them to be a part of that experience. Because back to being the oldest daughter, mm -hmm. a Latina, culturally, that's like, what, there's an expectation, you need to stay connected? Correct. And be helping the family kind of thing. Yes. And so for people to see, hey, you can kind of sort of do both mm -hmm. and that you're not totally disconnected and gone. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it also breaks some stereotypes about opportunities and, and people in that farm worker community, immigrant community, Latino community about opportunities for education, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some of these stories, of, of particularly second generation immigrants in the farming world and we've had other folks right here on the podcast who have like you and and it's this actually same story for me i was the first generation of my family mm -hmm. to go to college when, when you grow up in that rural farm life that's that had just wasn't the norm and then to have that opportunity and then to come back to your family to come back to that community mm -hmm pretty incredible experience I mean, that's what I've done with you know I went into communications I was in radio and all that and then came back now to bring the two together like you yeah. I share that same feeling um, and also my parents were pretty pumped too yeah. when, when I told them that I was gonna do that cool yeah um, talk about yeah that that farming community and the farm worker community how do you tap into that? I'm sure with your family connections, it's easier for you than some to like do what your dad was doing, recruit and let people know, hey, there are opportunities here. And you don't just have to be stuck doing this. I mean, if you love this, do this. But if you love something else, here's how you can work your way there. Mm -hmm. What's the trick to that? I think we, um, you know, coming to be a part of this organization, um, we do a lot of workshops for the students and help them evolve in their career. And one of the aspects that I'm having conversations with the staff about is, what about the parents? Because again, mm -hmm. um, we want the parents to understand the process. We want them to be um, involved. But I think that that just adds that m more of that element of them holding pride that they're child is accomplishing so much right and so right. we are looking at how we can incorporate a lot more of the parents uh being a part of that process and understanding the process as well because um like i said our our students uh we offer them the opportunity of four years but every year they have to renew their scholarship with us and mm -hmm. so if they don't meet the criteria within their scholarship um we're not able to fund them and the the um it's very minimal that students don't meet those, but when it happens, we want the parent to understand that because I'm sure it's pretty de de you know, devastating yeah. if you're not receiving that assistance. And so again, sure. have, having the parents be a part of that process and helping us hold the student accountable yeah. to meet those. And maintaining that connection too, because I wouldn't <laughs> have thought of that, the cultural issue there of well, especially like the oldest child or, you know, whatever the, the priority is, that, well, we don't want to sever that connection. Mm -hmm. We want that person to still, that child to still be connected mm -hmm. to overcome that. Like you can do both Yes. versus the old stereotype. Because um, back in the day, it was probably more like go to college, see you later. Don't know if we'll see you yeah. again kind of thing. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't have even thought of having to overcome 
that perception within the community and, and what the parents think and how they even understand. I mean, that was with my parents too. It was like, well, what do you really do mm -hmm. at college? You know, what, what's that? How's that? And is that going to help you get a job or why you were there? And, uh, you know, what, the purposes of education are, yeah, it's for work skills, but it's for other things too, and mm -hmm. personal enrichment, and it's growing up and finding your way and mm -hmm. all of these things, which is why the accountability part is good too, yes. because that uh, it can be a confusing time when sometimes you just feel like you want to party. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's like, I'm 21, I just want to, <laughs> well, no, you got to study. There are people supporting you to be here. Do you, you think there's a struggle to have particular, particularly young people in, in that farm worker community know that there's even these opportunities that they can go to college and get the support rather than feeling like that's just out of reach for me? I think there's a lot of, of um, information out there that there are uh, programs that can help you. I don't know how detailed that information is mm -hmm. for us it's really important to go out into the schools you know with covid we were we lost a lot of that high touch yeah. with the schools and, and we realized that when we compare our numbers of applicants from one year to the other yeah. and so this year our goal is to go out into the communities again bring in that parent component um, but also work with the schools, work with the counselors, and do more of that face-to-face -face because we train people, the students, how to apply for our scholarships because our scholarships are very are detailed as far as the information that we want from the student. And if they don't cross the T's and dot the I's, then you know it can be a four-point student, but if they did not meet all the criteria or submit all of the documentation, then we have to put them on the... Yeah. Sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. And we noticed that um, we had some boo-boos because of, I believe, because of COVID. Yeah. We just weren't out there. For sure. And so uh, making those face-to-face -face contacts is really important. I think another um, successful component of our program is, again, when I talk about the mentoring program, that we have so many volunteers from all um, walks of life. And... Um, I sat in on some of the phone conversations that were happening when um, some of the people were checking in with students. And one, it was delivered in their language, in mm -hmm. Spanish, because we do yeah. have a lot of students that, that are uh, Latinos from our communities. Yeah. Um, but two, it was culturally appropriate. It was, it was um, really comforting to um, have that check-in and hear the struggles that the student was facing because of COVID, because they weren't seeing their family. Yeah. Um, but I feel that the person that was mentoring addressed it so well. And um, when she got off the phone, I was like, wow, that was like truly from the heart. And I truly feel that that student heard what she had to hear yeah. and was grateful for having that message delivered to her. That kind of stuff is so important, and it often escapes people's understanding. Just with every person's own cultural experience, they may not recognize some of those different values that someone, you know, a different perspective someone may be coming from. It comes just comes down to how you communicate with them and mm -hmm. what, what's meaningful, what they care about, and what they don't care about. Yeah. What is it that, you know, to that end, what do you think it is that, the public, the, the people outside of the farming community, outside of the farm worker community don't understand and need to understand about farm workers, particularly in tree fruit or in any farming here in Washington. Obviously that they're very generous and they do wanna make a, a difference for their community. They want to serve their community. As you're mentioning, it's not about getting rich. It's mm -hmm. about how can I contribute to my community, support it, and, um, and, you know, we have some very humble donors that um, are anonymous and don't want yeah. to be recognized for it. They don't do it to be recognized. They're doing um, it because it's the right thing. Yes. Hmm. And I think that that's really important that, um, you know, there's the egg industry is not always fun. As, as we know, it's, hard, it's labor intense, um, but there's other aspects to it as well. And there's other opportunities for us within the egg yeah. community. Um, but they are always doing everything with the heart of, you know, paying it forward and, and serving others. What about farm workers 
as well. You know, I think there are a lot of misunderstandings and you know, some of this stuff ends up in the news of, you know, how are farm workers being treated? What are their lives really like? And people who are very disconnected with farming likely live in the Seattle metro area or somewhere and they care about how people are being treated, but they don't necessarily understand what life is like in the world of farming. Mm -hmm. What would you, what should those folks know about what, what the real challenges are, what the, you know, things are that people in that community and that culture care about and don't care about. I mean, you, you grew up yeah. in, in that family, in that culture, in that community. And I, I guess looking at it from a perspective of an orchardist, there's so many steps that to get to grow the fruit, yeah. to pick it, and to get it to the table, that it's not just bringing in someone to pick it and right. it, it shows up at your door. Right. I mean, there's so many behind the scenes details that have to happen, and there's so many other people that you have to work with. Um, and so... And I think that also, you know, there might be that reputation of, um, you know, you have to work 10 hours, 12 hours right. a day, right. but it's because of the fruit itself. It has only a certain time frame that you yeah. can pick it and process it and get it to the market. Absolutely. So there will be days that, you know, you're working those 10, 12 hour days, but it's because of the demands of yeah. Well, farmers product. and farm workers kind of their lives flow with that natural, you know, up and down mm -hmm. of you have busy season and you have slow season. Right. And in the winter, yeah, you may be able to travel a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in, you know, for me, it was July and rather June and July. Mm -hmm. And, you know, apples, it, you know, cherries at the same time. Apples may be August, September, October, like. You don't go anywhere. You just work, 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 and but then you get done, and then you have way more flexibility. Mm -hmm. That doesn't align, I think, with a lot of people's understanding, though, of labor. Mm -hmm. And I think there are perceptions that that's bad, and people don't like that. I don't know. The, the workers that I know, are, they understand, just like I did back when I was technically a farm worker, making farm worker straight wages before overtime and all that. It's like, I just want to make as much money as I can now. If I'm doing it, I better go like yeah. crazy. And then, I mean, that's how I paid my way through college myself as I worked 80, 90 hour weeks mm -hmm. planting corn to pay my, and I was able to pay most of my tuition every summer just by working that hard. It was exhausting, but I did it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's misunderstood too, that there's reward in that and people, you know, hard work can suck, but it still can be worth it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just an evil thing that somebody has to work hard. It gives you dignity. Yes. Yep. I don't know. What's, what's your family's perspective on that? I'm sure, you know, coming from the community that you do, hard work is a way of life. Exactly. Like what you said about your dad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, you know, it's kind of, like I said, my dad's kind of retired. Um, yeah. he, d he went back to Cherries this year, and um, I won't reveal my dad's age, but <laughs> he's getting up there. Yeah. Um, but he, it was really cute. I called him, and I'm like, Dad, I thought you weren't going to work. You know, what's going on? He said, no, I, I can't be at home. It's just I have to do something. And then I call him maybe two, three weeks later into cherry season, and he's like, oh, my gosh, I am not the spring chick I used to be. <laughs> you know, this year with how the industry kind of, you know, the weather yeah, kind of messed up sure. the season, everything. He was working um, till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning because he works in shipping and receiving. Mm -hmm. And then you would have to get up the next morning and come back to work at 8. Oof. And so he's like, I just, I this is it's really demanding. hard for me. And I said, yeah. well, you can always quit. And he said, no, I made a commitment. I made, you know, this is for <laughs> yeah. the duration of the season. I can think about it um, for next year and decide yeah. if I want to come back. But, you Cut know, it out. that okay. was part of how we grew up, that you yeah. made a decision, you are committed to it. And like you're saying, you know, if you have to work 12, 15 hour shifts, you're thinking, okay, I, I, this, this is what I signed up for and I got to pull it through. Yeah. And that's not necessarily, uh, at the end of the day, a terrible thing or exploitative as, you know, that word is thrown about a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's like calling any hard work exploitation cheapens the actual experience. Thankfully, from my experience, very few 
times when that actually does happen, it cheapens that by calling any hard work. It's like, no, this is what, in the farming community, this is what we all do. Farm mm -hmm. worker, farmer, everybody is just doing it. Yeah. I don't know if that was your experience oh, or yeah. what you see now. Yeah, what, what everybody's got to be crazy busy right now. Is it, are you even able to get a hold of any donors or anything right now? I mean, we're in the well, just the, early days of apple harvest, right? Right, but there's that little break right before school starts. And so I think this is the week everybody took vacation because yep. I am sending emails out and they're like, I'm out till Monday. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then we start picking, so you won't get, <laughs> get a hold of me then either. Yeah. So what do you think, you know, stepping back, this whole world of tree fruit and farming here in Washington, what do people need to know about it? And especially with your perspective, having left that world into education and then come back. You, you have a unique, I'm sure unique insights into this world of agriculture? It's something we need because again, it's putting food on the table and yeah. we're not only serving our local community, we're serving the nation, we're serving yeah. internationally. Yeah. Um, so it's always going to be an industry that exists. Um, and uh, you, know, you look at uh, the market, how they are trying to um, expand the variety of choices that we have. Right. Um, so I see it as ever growing. Um, it will always exist. And um, I think that we'll always have students that will either come from the industry or want to go into the industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's encouraging for the future of our food system. And you know, my bias, <laughs> just to be fully transparent, is to keep as much of that food production here in Washington as possible. Because the alternative is, if it's not feasible for whatever reason here, goes elsewhere. Yeah. And I think that's a loss for everybody if that happens, compared to keeping our food production here and local. I think there's enough for everyone. <laughs> I hope so. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing your story here with us. And thank you for the work that you're doing to kind of expand and, and support that community. That's important, and again, I don't think a lot of people know about it, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to find out more and be able to share that with other people. Well, thank you for the opportunity, and um, you know, if anyone would like any more information, especially so about some of our scholarships, because they are, we do have scholarships that are in memory of an individual from mm -hmm. the industry, they can definitely go to WAEF, W-A-E-F dot org, and look at our information, and also if they're interested in making a donation, mm -hmm. we also... Uh, can take donations through our website. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 